Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first BSA Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Roundtable for the 2022-2023 program year. We're absolutely delighted to have you here. Tonight's topic is Leave No Trace Coast Fishing. I can't think of a better summertime topic to kick off the year. So here's a quick peek at our agenda for this roundtable. Our safety moment will be a time to think about hazard trees. Then we'll move right to Howard Kern, who will share his expertise on applying leave no trace when we go fishing. Uh, the chair of the Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Subcommittee, Scott Anderson, will then take us through the recent outdoor ethics changes to Scout's BSA rank advancement. After Scott, we'll hear from Matt Durant about the Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Conference that's going to be held in Georgia this coming November. And we'll wrap up with announcements and questions and answers. So with that, let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Scout oath. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Two. Scout law. The scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. And of course, we need the outdoor code. So I'm gonna do it my way here. As an American, I will do my best to be clean in my outdoor manners, to be careful with fire, be considerate in the outdoors, be conservation-minded. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Matt for our safety moment. All right, so um, today we're gonna talk a little bit about hazard trees. Uh, so uh, a lot of the places where we go camping uh, are forested. Perhaps maybe if you live in uh, some parts of Kansas or Iowa, that may not be the, the, the case. You have to watch out for hazard cornfields or something, but uh, we're gonna talk for a minute just about hazard trees. So if you go ahead and, and go to the next slide, Paul, that would be great. Um, so when you go to a designated site that's in a forested area, most government agencies by law are required to uh, check for hazard trees and take care of them if they're around. Now that doesn't mean that, that they're gonna get every single one of them. It takes some time to come around and, and look at all the campgrounds and whatnot. Um, so you wanna make sure that when you go to a site, take a look uh, around you and note any trees that might be standing and dead or dead limbs that might be uh, partially attached that could fall at, at any time. Um, and so, uh, or, or trees that perhaps look rotten, uh, anything that looks unstable uh, could possibly make that a hazard tree. Uh, and so uh, if it does have a hazard tree, uh, you may want to choose a different site. You'll definitely wanna let the managing agency know about that. Um, if you can't do that, or if you're uh, not an, uh, like an established site, uh, uh, you'll want to make sure that uh, where you set up your, your cooking and sleeping areas, um, they're at least one and a half times the fall radius of the tree. So, so look at the height of the tree, um, estimate how far the very top of it would hit if it fell over in any direction, and then you want to be at least half the length of the, of the tree further out from that. And that will just keep everything everybody safe. Um, if you can avoid camping anywhere near dead trees or anything like that, um, that's always the best. But, uh, you know, in some circumstances, uh, trees could fall at any time. Um, so that's especially true if you're in a burn zone somewhere that has recently burned. Um, you want to make sure that that you're very careful about that. Uh, you also want to make sure not to use hazard trees or dead trees uh, to hang things on like bear bags or support tents or canopies or hammocks or anything because the weight of that can pull that. Um, and then you also want to make sure that you're aware of any kind of environmental or weather concerns um, because the trees might be look fairly stable right now 
now. Uh, but as soon as we get any kind of wind, uh, those trees can become very scary uh, very quickly. Um, I've seen a good number of trees fall over in windstorms. Um, and then once you've done that, if you've located any hazard trees or anything like that, just make sure to let others know that may be camping in the area or perhaps the land management agency uh, that there could be a tree, a tree hazard in the campground. Um, go ahead and advance the slide, Paul. Um, there's plenty of information online that you can look up. The, this particular page is by the Idaho Panhandle National Forest. Um, talks about ways to identify hazard trees, what to look for. So the dead trees, the broken branches, uh, material, that, that's a, a ginormous bald eagle nest that's there. Sometimes those can fall. Um, or signs of disease or leaning are things you might want to look for. Um, so some nice guidelines and some nice uh, information. Would it be a if I did this like a turquoise color or All right. color? Uh, with that said, we'll wrap it up and turn giant. it back over to you, Paul. All right. At this point, I'd like to introduce our, our primary speaker for the evening, Howard Kern. Um, Howard Kern is the guy who's written the book on Leave No Trace in the Fishing. And with that, I'm going to give control over to him and let him start to talk to us. Okay, great, Paul. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the, the invitation and the time to spend with you guys tonight. Uh, without a doubt, this is a... Uh, uh, a uh, a topic of passion for me that actually started out uh, as a scout. As a matter of fact, when I was young, we would go backpacking a lot. I was in a troop that did a tremendous amount of uh, backpacking and it became very obvious very early. If you remember back to the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, the freeze dried food was not necessarily the most tasty. So fishing became a uh, a primary focus for me because we were going up into California, Sierra Nevada, uh, over into the Grand Canyon and such, and there's some great fishing and trout fishing in the Grand Canyon. Um, and it was very, very obvious that if you wanted to have a very good meal as opposed to some freeze dried uh, denty uh, stew or something like that, uh, it was important that you learn how to fish and then it kind of morphed from there. So let me just advance here. There we go. Sorry. Okay, tonight we're gonna to be talking about fishing ethics. Um, what I wanna do is give you a little bit of history of, uh, of what, what this, how this kind of came about. Um, and then I'm gonna go through some of the, some, but not all of the uh, principles behind ethical fishing. And what I'm gonna make the assumption is, is that this group and scouting in general, which has done a phenomenal job over the last 20 years of really incorporating uh, the leave no trace ethical principles um, I'm going to leave a lot of the more basic rudimentary issues of leave no trace uh, out, out of it, just in the essence of time. If you want to kind of bone up on that part of it, I would recommend downloading the North American uh, Leave No Trace Skills and Ethics booklet from the center and, you know, just going to go about that way. Um, and I'll talk about at the end some really good resources that I would recommend if you wanted to incorporate this into any of your trainers courses or for the, any of you that are teaching master's courses, we can get into a little bit deeper discussion about that. Okay. Okay. So this is really where the rubber meets the road as far as why we want to talk about this. Um, fishing as an activity, especially an outdoor activity, is one of the most popular in the country. And these are statistics from 2019, but I'd be willing to bet they've gone up even more with everybody due to the pandemic going to the out of doors instead of doing other kind of recreational activities going you know, to Europe or whatever. Uh, but basically 17% of the US population ages six and up went fishing one time in 2019. And you could see on the screen, the breakdown of the demographic, um, and it's not all male. You know, you have 36% female as well. So it is a broad, broad based, based uh, group of people that like to participate in this. And in 2019, total participation was over 50 million people. Uh, so, you know, it is truly something that you have people participating in. And I would envision as we look at our uh, scout venturing units, you know, that that number or percentage is much higher than that. So it's important to really kind of incorporate these particular talking points we're going to go through today uh, into your conversations, whether you're doing a roundtable presentation, something like this, a trainer's course, or even just visiting a unit. Um, it's important to be able to understand some of the more core concepts of why and how you would do 
uh, ethical and you know low impact type of fishing. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. Okay, now I talk about the beginnings of this. So you know, realistically, what how this came about was prior to 2000. Uh, I was involved in both the Boy Scouts as well as I was a big member of what's called an organization called Trout Unlimited, and we'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, but Trout Unlimited really didn't have anything on it, and I saw the Boy Scouts definitely didn't have anything on it. And I had reached out to uh, a gentleman that precursored a, uh, an individual that's well known probably in this group, uh, Ben Lahan, a gentleman by the name of Scott Reed. And I introduced myself. And at the time, I was the California education chair for Trout Unlimited in the state of California. And I specifically asked, I said, hey, is there anything on this? And he said, no, there's nothing on it. Uh, truly, they had no, no work on it. Um, once again, you have to remember, this is kind of the very beginnings of the, the center and how it got organized, but um, they hadn't done any work on it whatsoever. So you get to 2001, um, and that is when I went through my master educator course. Uh, I went through a Knowles course up in Yosemite, California, and my specific teaching, teaching topic was leave no trace fishing ethics. So I wrote this, you know, to the right, you see this uh, little front page of that, it's actually like an eight page document that I put together and sent to the center and also had worked with Trout Unlimited, as a matter of fact. And this was kind of the nexus of it. Um, moving forward, Ben Lawhon uh, took over from Scott Reed in 2001, 2002. And uh, for those of you that knew Ben at the center, um, ben was also a very avid fly fisherman. So he and I got along just swimmingly, as a matter of fact. And we had a further conversation about how we could kind of move this forward. Obviously, a, a small nonprofit like the center didn't have a lot of resources around it, but um, further discussion brought out and widened the circle as far as people that would input uh, get an input on this. We talked with a number of fisheries biologists, uh, as well as other resource uh, natural resources specialist, uh, both in the Forest Service as well as the Park Service, um, and we kind of came to the kind of came to a, a nexus of starting to write what is now the Leave No Trace Fishing pamphlet, and that was actually produced in 2004. Um, if you look in the back, you'll actually see my name as as was mentioned before. Um, around that time, we were looking at, and you can see on the left here. Um, that's me teaching fly fishing at one of the National Order of the Arrow conferences. Um, I was working with a gentleman by the name of Ben Giselma. Many of you may or may not know him. He was the one that started up the, uh, the BSA fishing task force. And uh, we worked together on kind of trying to incorporate more and more fishing into uh, the BSA, understanding that it's such a large uh, population of people that do go fishing on an annual basis. So at that time, they were looking at updating a number of the Merit Badge pamphlets. The fishing Merit Badge pamphlet was, uh, was going to be going through a rewrite. At the same time, they wanted to introduce the fly fishing Merit Badge, which is something that I am very passionate about. Uh, and so, you know, at that time, I was asked to write the Leave No Trace portion of it. Uh, so when you go look through the Leave No Trace, or excuse me, the fly fishing and fishing Merit Badge pamphlets, you can see almost verbatim everything that I've written. So that's kind of how it went. Those were rolled out in 2006. Uh, they've gone through a couple of updates, as a matter of fact. But for the most part, everything written in there is kind of accepted gospel as far as kind of some basic rudimentary um, metrics on how you go about doing a fish, going on an a ethical fishing outing. OK, Paul, next slide. All right, so we're going to go through the now we're going to go through the, you know, the principles and I'm going to, like I said before, I'm not going to get into the nuts and bolts of yes, you need to bring a map. Yes, you need to bring or GPS or something like that, you know, all this other fun stuff that on a normal adding you need to do, you need to understand that those are layered on top of what I'm going to be talking about. But one of the most important things is know the regulations and know the type of fish you're going after in the specific areas you're fishing. It's, it's important because as Paul and I were having a conversation earlier, uh, there's a number of game and non-game fish, and it's very important to be able to identify those more than anything. The most important on top of everything else is the right license. And you can buy a license, and I can give you an example. I was fishing in Montana just two weeks ago, and you not only needed to buy a state fishing license, you also needed to buy a special uh, special trout stamp 
or designation on that as well. These are important for two reasons. One is uh, they are, you know, a way of kind of keeping track of who's doing angling in the state or in the areas. And then two, the funds that generated from licenses, uh, specifically the special trout stamp type of license, goes to pay for biologists to do continue work to keep these resources available for the general public. So it is truly something that is very, very important. Um, you know, then you get into the regulations of li fish limits, um, length limits. You know, are you looking at getting, you know, they're, believe it or not, you can get too big a fish, <laughs> you know, sometimes. Um, you know, do you have your, you know, the correct boat registration requirements if you're using a boat? And, you know, once again, safety first, you want to include your life jackets as anytime you get on a boat. Um, that's very, very important. Next of all, do you have the correct gear? Um, this can be very, very important in the sense that, you know, if you're hiking and you're going into an area that, you know, you plan on going wading and you don't have the current, the correct gear, there's safety issues in the sense that you can get hypothermia and such if you're going into some of these very high, high altitude creeks and such. Um, plus also you can do tremendous damage uh, to the ecosystem uh, by using the wrong kind of waders, for example. There's old school waders that have cleats on them. Uh, those are not cool to use anymore. Um, and you know, you want to make sure not to use something like that. Is live bait allowed? There's many times where you know live bait is not allowed, you know, and we're talking anything from night crawlers to um, actually using live bait fish. So that's something important to be aware of. And then what about exotic species? These are things that, uh, these are species, and Paul, we touched on this, you know, is there something that is non-native to the, to the water, the watershed, and is that something you need to be aware of, okay? So very, very important. You always want to prepare for extreme weather and emergencies. Many times when we go fishing, we're going into, you know, upper, upper high country areas, and you can run into issues there, um, and then you also want to pack a large, strong past plastic litter bag. And, you know, we'll touch on that a little bit um, right now, you know, but later on, we're going to get into more de depth of it. You know, fishing can tend to generate a decent amount of waste, whether it's line or in trails or anything along those lines. You want to be able to bring out, bring that out, you know, pack it in, pack it out type of thing. And then finally, once again, do you have a good map? That is the most important because once again, if you're going into areas, uh, high, high Sierra trout streams, for example, it's very easy to get disoriented. And it's like, oh, am I on, on uh, this creek or I am on this stream right here? And make sure you know where you're going. So very, very important. Next slide, please. Okay, this is very important in the sense that when we're talking about watershed uh, areas, they are extremely fragile. And you know, when you travel and camp on durable surfaces, it is very important to understand that these ecosystems can be heavily impacted. And I'm sure many of you that have gone fishing in the past have seen areas where you have a lot of people that are entering into a specific area and how the vegetation can, can trample down. It's muddy, uh, that, that not, uh, generates silt and such, which is bad for the fish. Um, it is a, definitely a, uh, an important thing to be very aware of where you're at, where you're at and how you're entering and exiting the water. That is a, just a very, very important thing. Um, as I mentioned in here, the riparian zone, which is that, that real heavy, dense vegetative area between the water and actually the, the, the dry landmass, that is a very, very uh, heavy, dense area that has a lot of different life in it. And it's very important not to impact that because that truly is uh, you know, kind of a, fit, a food source for a lot of uh, the animals that live in, in, in and near the water. Uh, as well as, you know, it keeps the flooding down whenever you any, run into any rainstorms. So very, very important. You want to access waters in designated areas or establish entryways. As I mentioned before, that's the most important thing. Is it, If you're using a boat or a float tube, that is always a very good thing because those are very, very non-impactful. Um, a float tube, for those of you that don't know, you'll see fly fisher, the fly fishermen that will be out on a lake and they literally have like a big tube around them, you know, like a big inner tube and they'll be floating on that. That is truly uh, a very low impact way of fishing and actually gets you into places where a lot of people can't get to. So it's a fantastic way to actually do some great fishing. Uh, if you are waiting, uh, travel on rock and, gra rock and gravel areas and of the stream of the river. In other words, as you're going down the river, um, as you're waiting, try and stay on that as opposed to the vegetative areas. 
Docks and jetties are an excellent areas to fish from. And you'll see, I have a picture right there. Talk about low impact as far as being able to, to fish. That is probably the best as far as being able to go and participate in the sport and not necessarily have an impact by entering or exiting the water. Paul, next slide, please. Okay, dispose of waste properly. Many of you that have gone fishing might have seen these little tubes right here. These really started coming around, I would say about 20 years ago or so, and they've become much more prevalent. Um, I'll touch on that in just a second. The first thing I want to touch on is fish, fish and trails. Fish and trails, uh, there's a number of different diseases that uh, can affect fish within the trout populations, and especially in the western half of the United States. There's a, uh, a disease that actually came over from New Zealand called whirling disease. Uh, and whirling disease can be very, very detrimental to fish populations. So, you know, by catching a fish, a lot of times in the past, people thought it was okay to gut a fish and then throw the entra entrails back into the water. Um, you know, hey, other fish will feed on these, it'll be, go it'll be okay. Similar to a lot of people that I'm sure you teach now that think it's okay to take an, to eat an apple and throw the apple core, you know, out because, hey, it's biodegradable. It will, it will biodegrade over time. Not the case in this way. In, in this case, um, entrails can be actually very damaging if they do have those spores in them. So you want to handle it like human waste. You want to bury them 200 feet away from any water and, or pack them out using a strong garbage bag, uh, which is what I touched on earlier. Very, very important. Anglers should make every attempt to ret uh, retrieve snag lures and broken line. I don't know how many times I've been fishing where you'd be walking down a stream or a lakeside and you find where somebody's gotten their lure hung up or something along those lines and you have monofilament uh, lines sitting all over the place. Uh, that is a detrimental thing to the economy or the ecology of that local area. And as I mentioned in here, monofilament line in particular has an average shelf life of two or three years, which even in the outdoors can even be uh, can be just as long and, and fluorocarbon can last even that much longer. So leaving that stuff is very, very can be very, very detrimental because animals, critters can get a hold of that, eat it, it becomes a problem. You know, it's also unsightly. So do everything you possibly can to retrieve any kind of snag line or anything along those lines. Lead sinkers, for the most part, have been kind of phased out. It's similar to uh, ammunition now. You know, we're, we're dealing with tungsten instead, but there still are people that fish with lead sinkers or have jigs. You should avoid those completely for obvious reasons. Lead is a, a, a detrimental thing to any ecology. Um, and, you know, birds and other animals will, will go ahead and think that's food and they'll eat them and it becomes a real issue as far as the wildlife is concerned. So do me a favor, stay away from those. Tungsten, as I mentioned, is a preferred uh, version of a weight that you could use or a sinker. So that's definitely something you want to to explore instead. And then never, ever dump unwanted live bait or bait boxes. You want to pack that stuff out. It's very, very important that you do that. Um, because, you know, you're introducing a, a species that may not necessarily be uh, belong there. And even though live bait may be allowed where you're fishing, it is something you just do not want to do. So pack that stuff out. Getting back to the tube, you'll see there that little that little tube right there. If you have the fishing line that you've caught and you don't want to throw it away yourself, they can actually recycle that, believe it or not. And you put those in those tubes and people will come around and collect those. There's been a lot of Eagle Scout projects that have put these up around lakefronts, stream sides and such, and they are effective. And so definitely encourage people to recycle their fishing, fishing line whenever possible. Paul, next slide. Okay, leave what you find. Okay, this is where the rubber meets the road as far as when we talk about low impact or kind of managing the resource as far as the actual fish themselves. We're talking about catch and release. Now, a lot of people may or may not understand it, and I'm not going to here to kind of go through the, the, the very detailed portions of how you catch and release a fish, but it's important to understand some of the basics behind it, and we can get into more detail on it later on. You'll see my my cell phone and my email. I'm happy to answer questions. But one thing is definitely you can catch a fish and release it 
revived back into the stream or into the water, and it has a very high survival. Some some words in in the north of 85 to 90 percent of fish that are caught and released properly will survive to be caught another day. So that's a big deal. That's a really really big deal. So be very aware of how to catch the fish, not only when you're catching it, but how to release it as well. So let's go through this really quick. You do not want to fight a fish until it's utterly exhausted. You want to, you know, don't sit there and play it. You want to pull it in. Definitely bring it in as, oh, probably we went forward. There we go. Um, you want to have a net that is base that is, that is a, uh, that is going to be fish friendly, so to speak. And there's a number of them that are like that. They are more plastic and, and feel than your old like nylon nets are concerned. Nylon nets can catch gills and such. Not a good thing. So use a net. Uh, absolutely. The most important thing when you're bringing in the fish is before you grab it, please do me a favor, wet your hands. If you don't wet your hands, your dry hands, fish have an anti-microbacterial uh, coating on them. And that is actually a protection for them. So when you grab a fish with your, with your dry hands, what you're effectively doing is taking that film off of them and it makes them susceptible to the disease. And that's not, a, that's not what we want. So please do me a favor, wet your hands before. It keeps that film on the fish, very, very important. When you can't, when you do bring in the fish, you, if, whether you're netting it or you're bringing it in by hand, you want to make sure you're grasping it firmly, but don't squeeze it. Okay, don't squeeze it like you wouldn't believe, and try and hold it uh, in a lateral in a lateral fashion. If you have forceps or any kind of needle nose pliers, try and remove the hook that way. Um, if not, if you don't, just try and use your hand. We're going to get into barbless and barbed hooks in just a second here, but preferably using a barbless hook, which makes it a lot easier to, to take that hook out of the mouth of the fish. The, the thing about that is that it makes it harder to catch the fish because they don't have a barb, but that's kind of what we need to give up for. Um, is if the fish has taken a hook deeply, and this has happened a couple of times, and you'll see that many times with those panther martin lures or the tri lures, um, that have the try the try hooks on them. Um, a lot of times, fish will take that and take it in deep. What you need to do is instead of trying to rip that out of the fish's mouth, which is really going to cause a mortality issue, you really want to cut as much as possible, try and snip off that that hook, and then release that way. It's actually, believe it or not, the fish has a, has a very good chance of still surviving with that hook in its mouth, even though it's it's that deep in there. So it's very very important. Uh, and then, you know, cut the leader. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, do everything you possibly can to keep it as clean as possible. So that's that's one thing. Next slide, Paul. Whenever you're seeing, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures or a picture here really quick. Whenever you're doing, you know, bringing in a fish, you want to keep it in the, in the water as much as possible. You have to remember, we're air breathing animals. You know, we're used to this kind of environment. Fish live in the water, you know, so when you're taking them out of it, it's like it'd be like the inverse of somebody taking you and pushing you down into the water. You want to keep them in the water as much as possible. And then when you're get when you're ready to release it, you want to place it in the water with the head upstream. So the, the water flow is going over its gills. Very, very important that you do that, not downstream, upstream. So it's getting that oxygen to its gills and can start recover. Then you move it back and forth slowly. And you'll notice that the fish either has some fight in it, or if it doesn't, if it doesn't have any fight or want to get away, just keep doing it until ultimately it will swim away. Okay. And it will swim away and it is revived and it has been uh, released properly at that point. Once again, barbless hooks are the law in, in some situations in many fly fishing areas. Um, it is absolutely the law. You know, they lower the mortality rates among fish. And, you know, even if you're in an area where you can use a barbed hook, Using a barbless hook is, is a preferable way on a low impact type of methodology as far as fishing is concerned. It's very easy. If you have a barbed hook, just take a pair of pliers and pinch that barb down. Very, very simple to do. Um, and then once again, even catch and release can be done if you've caught enough for the day. And Lord, I, I, I live to have that day, but it has not come along yet. Um, if you've caught enough and you know when that is, consider leaving the rest of fish in peace and simply simping and, and enjoying yourself, okay? Next slide. Okay, we talked about barbless versus barbed hooks. You can buy barbed hooks, the one on the bottom here. And just like I said, take a pliers either while you're there or before you get out there and pinch that barb down. It's very, very simple. Or just go to, you know, when you go to the store, uh, your, your local tackle shop, 
you buy a barbless hook. That's the easiest thing to do. And you can see how easy it is to pull it out. No problem. Next slide, please. Okay, a couple things. Now here on the right-hand side of your screen is that's what I'm talking about as far as a lateral, you know, you want to have the fish in a lateral sense, putting them down on the water, holding him. Uh, remember that these, these guys out of the water aren't going to get any oxygen. Just going back and forth is going to, is going to give them that, that water force through their gills, and then they'll revive and take off. So that's perfect. And you know, what's funny is the picture on the left is actually from the fishing mirror patch. <laughs> um, please do me a favor. Don't ever hold a fish up like this. Okay. You know, picture, picture yourself being like hung upside down and held by your leg. Okay. It's just not, the fish is a lateral fish. It's not, a, you know, it's a lateral animal. It's not, it's not a horizontal animal and picture being held up by your, you know, by your leg or something like that, that way by all your body weight. Don't do that. Always hold it like you see on the right hand side and then release it properly. If you're going to keep the fish, great, fantastic. Bring it in. You know, we want to respect the resource and we want to respect the fish that we bring in. Paul, next slide. Okay, leave what you find. And this is kind of touches on some of the boating uh, principles as well. But you always want to make sure you clean your boat, your gear and clothing after a fishing trip so you don't spread invasive species, whether that's zebra mussels, New Zealand mud snails, you know, I mentioned whirling disease, all this other stuff. We're now dealing with a plethora of various invasives from through, you know, that have come to the United States from other parts of the world. And we really need to manage towards it. Um, I mentioned New Zealand mud snails. Those actually were brought over in the 1990s from, of all places, New Zealand. And it became just widespread throughout the Western half of the United States over basically a decade. And it was really kind of a disappointing thing because you went from a not having to worry about this stuff to being very, very concerned about it. So when you do have waders and boots, you should use a 50% solution, one part chlor chlorine, one part water, dip your waders in that solution of bleach or, or spray it on, or you could use a 10% solution, one part chlorine, nine parts water and soak your equipment for 10 minutes. As you can see, you know, these are actual, these are actual signs that I took pictures of just a couple of weeks ago, you know, all different states. This is Montana right here, worrying about mussels, quagga mussels, things like that. You want to make sure everything is dry. Um, you know, everything has been cleaned off completely. Uh, it is just the only way to really be certain that we are not spreading invasives uh, to other watersheds that we like to enjoy. Paul, next slide. Okay, I'd mentioned this earlier. You know, this is actually a picture of what are called Southern California steelhead trout. Um, these are, you know, this is a picture from, I believe, the 1990s or, so, or excuse me, uh, from the 1890s and such. And this is what we used to do. This is what we used to do if, uh, you know, when we fished. It was like, hey, let's catch all this fish. Isn't it great? When the resource was very plentiful. It's not the case anymore. So being very aware, you know, and we do run into people from time to time that still think it's okay to, uh, to go ahead and, and fish like this. Just, you know, catch what you want catch what you plan to eat, the rest of it release, release back in the wild. And if you're doing it properly, that resource is going to self-sustain itself over a long period of time when we've done exactly what we wanted to do. Next slide, please. Okay, respect wildlife, humane killing of fish. I'd mentioned the, the lure situation where a fish gets, you know, caught, uh, you know, you might get a tri-barb, uh, you know, hook on it in its mouth and it's just, it's, it's a mess. Okay, so we need to respect the fish. And in a situation like that, where you feel this is just not gonna be good, it's just not something you wanna dispatch that fish. Same thing if you're gonna be keeping fish. It's very, very important. It used to be, and I used to do this, this was how I was raised as a kid, that you would catch fish and you'd put them on a stringer and leave them sitting in the water. And they would be sitting there just kind of like floating in the water. And you know that's not, that's not a respectful way to, to, to handle the fish. And it's actually something that, in my opinion, can be then not good as far as if you plan on eating the fish as well. So what you want to do is you want to dispatch it as fast as possible. If you don't let it, you know, don't let it sit on a stringer. The most, the quickest way is actually just sharp blow to the back of the head, right behind, you know, the eyes right there. If you feel like that's not doing it, you can actually just make a, make a cut uh, and cut the, the spinal cord as well. Okay. What you want to do at the same time, if you're planning on eating that fish, though, is please clean it right away. 
Uh, you don't want a dead fish with its entrails in there. Take the time. Once you've dispatched it, open it up, uh, clean out the entrails and everything like that. Make sure it's completely taken care of that way. And then pack it in ice or put it in a, in a plastic bag and put it back in the water so it's at least being cool. Um, don't kill fish you find undesirable. Some people, you know, I've seen, uh, you know, people that don't like panfish or these things called sunfish or whatever. They're not problematic to the, to the watershed, nothing at all, but people just throw them out. Don't do that. Please, if they're non-game fish, they are part of the ecosystem. Many rivers have what are called sucker fish, and you can actually catch those. Um, they're great for the ecosystem, but, you know, a lot of people just think, you know, what the heck, I'll throw them out there. Um, one, one, aspect of that, and this is something Paul and I will, we might have a conversation afterwards about, um, is if it's an invasive species that is actually predates on the native species, and in my case, brown trout predate on uh, trout in the Sierra Nevada called golden trout, and they're actually considered to be a bad thing. So we are encouraging people whenever they go up in the Sierras, if they catch a brown trout, if they aren't going to eat it, at least take it out of a watershed. Uh, because they are not native to that area and actually eat the other uh, the native fish, which are threatened at this time. So that's a great example. And then once again, treat the, resp the resource and others with respect. It is an absolute privilege to be outdoors, especially lately uh, with the pandemic and stuff. Have a tremendous amount of respect for uh, for the for the resource. So continue on for not only are the rest of our lives for our next generations. Next slide, Paul. Okay, be considerate of other visitors. You always hear about this. Travel in small groups no longer than prescribed by the land managers. That's a big deal. You want to, you know, fish can be very, very easily spooked. So if you're traveling, especially with a scout troop, um, you know, boys can be very, very rambunctious, as well can girls. Um, just be very cognizant of that, especially if somebody else is fishing nearby, because you can scare all the fish away and really upset somebody very, very easily. You want to select fishing spots and campsites away from other groups. If you see that somebody's fishing on a part of a stream, move up or downstream. It's very, very easy to do so. Who knows? You might even find a better place to fish. All right. Um, it, it's just very, very important to do. Always travel quietly. Um, make sure your colors are not, you know, really loud, obviously. And then obviously the other thing is, is that in many of the backcountry areas, you run into gates and such, um, cattle gates, things like that. You want to be respectful of private property and leave gates open or closed as you find them. Very, very important. You'll see that a lot. I keep on mentioning the Sierra Nevada, but there's a lot of cattle grazing up in that area. And many times, you know, people think they need to close the gate when actually they, the, the rancher wants the, the cattle going in between two meadows and closing it actually doesn't allow that to happen. So leave things as you find them. Next slide. Okay, this is this is something I wanted to just kind of touch on briefly, and you know it's really important because uh, when I've done just a little bit of history on me, once again, like I said, I went through my master's course back in 2001, and then I was actually teaching Leave No Trace master courses for a while. I've done a ton of trainers courses, and having a conversation around fishing, while to me. It's just the way I was raised, and it was something that, in my opinion, was a uh, just a natural thing, and it was okay to do. Um, obviously, there's 50 million people, you know, in 2019 that that participated in that. Um, there are some people that find it to be uh, ethically not palatable, as a matter of fact, similar to hunting. Uh, although I think hunting tends to to be a little bit more polarizing. And what I think is important is is that you can have a conversation with a with a group that you're training or just having an overall conversation with in you know in total um and really be able to see both sides of it i think that the people that are 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 polarized by fishing you need to be able to explain some of the the nuts and bolts behind it um like i mentioned you know doing a a low impact methodology as far as fishing is concerned you know, has a very high success ratio as far as releasing the fish and having the, the fish being survive, surviving. You're paying license fees and thing, everything along those lines. At the same time, you need to understand their point of view and respect that point of view at, uh, as well and say, you know, I understand 
this is what we do to make things a little bit better. So hopefully you're not necessarily converting them, but it doesn't turn into a polarizing conversation when you're on a five-day master's course or doing a weekend trainer's course or something like that. So it's very, very important. You know, a lot of people don't necessarily go fishing just to catch fish. And that's why I included this quote from Thoreau. Um, you know, they go fishing for the peace. It's just like people that go rock climbing or people that go backpacking or whatever. They do so for the peace of it, for the tranquility of it, to hear the rustling water, to, to really be part of nature. Uh, and that is a big part of it more, more than anything for many people. So that's another thing to really, really remember when you're having a conversation with people. All right, Paul, next slide. Okay, now we I get to turn it over to Michael Brand. Michael, you go ahead and unmute. Um, you know, I'm going to introduce Michael. Michael is a BSA certified angling instructor and has just been absolutely adamant about training people for uh, fishing, as a matter of fact, and how to in in incorporate a fishing program, not only at the troop level district or council, uh, but, you know, uh, on a lifetime basis as well. There's a lot of resources available, and I don't want to steal too much of his thunder, but, you know, you'll see down at the bottom there. He's actually going to be teaching a uh, certified angling instructor course uh, right before the uh, this year's 2022 National Outdoor Ethics Conference. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael. You go ahead and cover what you want to cover. Uh, Michael does have some of his class from his virtual uh, certified angling instructor course on tonight for this roundtable. So I think that's just an added treat. So, Michael, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Howard. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, that component of the presentation tonight is actually what our class, the CAA instructor class, is going to cover uh, one component of today's session. The CAI Certified Angling Instructor Program was developed in about 2005, and it was developed because what we found is that the Fly Fishing Merit Badge was not having a lot of adoption by a lot of youth mainly because there weren't a lot of people that knew how to fly fish or teach it. And so we started working on that, Benji Alsama and his group, and that's what happened. But what has happened since then, and really happened since I got involved in the program in 2013, we are reaching down at a much earlier age and teaching fishing at the Cub Scout level, at that first grade level, all the way up to the fifth grade level. The Boy Scouts see this as an opportunity to recruit new Scouts. It's a way for us to potentially keep them in the program longer. And it's a great way for us to actually re-engage some lost Scouts. And so what we do is we explain not to have just a quote fishing derby, where you give every parent a, um, a rod and reel and say, hey, go fish. Our job is, is to make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity to catch a fish. Now, I love that quote that, uh, that Howard had on his last one that uh, Thoreau said that we, we don't really realize that catching a fish isn't what we're really after. I can assure you that a six-year-old is purely there to catch a fish. And so our job is to make sure that we can do that. And so that's what we teach. Some of the statistics that Howard talked about were right on, and I can speak a little bit more to what has happened in 21, or 20 and 21, and what we're seeing in 22 now. Uh, the Angler Instructor Program is funded by Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation, and they've just released their statistics. For the years 20 and 21, the growth in fishing was astronomical, and it was because of COVID, and people couldn't go out. We didn't spend money at the ball game. We didn't spend money at the theater. We couldn't do anything, and what we found is that families went back to the outdoors. Well, that's where scouting has been all along. What we also found is that it was difficult to get together as a scouting unit to do these things, but families were going out on their own and they were getting educated by using the internet. And so if you notice, if you tried to go out and buy any fishing equipment in 20 or 21, 
You couldn't find it. Why? Two reasons. One, it was flying off the shelves because people were buying it. And number two, we couldn't get any replacement gear in. The other thing that's interesting is when the gear went out, the color scheme of the gear was pink and purple. And that was because the marketing gurus and the fishing companies knew what Howard said, the fastest growing aspect of fishing is the female population. And guess who scouting just put into play? Females. So we've got this great opportunity and it's appealing to everybody. And then the next part is we found out that very few of our units actually offer it. What we found is, is fishing is fourth among scouting interest, but unfortunately only 35% of our units do it. So you have to ask yourself, well, why aren't we doing it? And the reason we're not going out there fishing can be narrowed down into five areas. Number one, we've lost two generations to fishing in the outdoors. You know, my grandfather took me fishing and he took his father, my father fishing and my father took me fishing. My son had no interest in fishing and his, my grandson, I'm hoping to get him involved, but that is what has happened. The other thing of the family is not going out and camping. So we've got this whole problem of non-education and knowing that our adult leaders do not want to fail in front of their kids. They're not going to try to do something that's going to put them out of their comfort zone. The second thing is fishing equipment is very complicated. You just happen to go to a brass pro shop and you look at this. Let's just take what Howard was talking about. Let's go look at the hook selection. Oh my God, you'll get completely overwhelmed with what hooks. Same is true with rods and reels. So what should we get? And they don't know. So what's easier for them to do is skip the fishing program. But let's say we're able to find out what we want to fish with. Where do we go to fish? And it's easy to find a spot maybe where you could take your family of four, but if you're trying to find a pack location where you can bring 60 boys and their siblings and their parents to a piece of shoreline and have uh, toilet facilities available, oh my gosh, we, we can't do that. And so the packs pretty well say, no, we can't do that. The next thing is, is there fish there? And fishing is critical. The, what's the fish stock look like? What's the temperature? I mean, so many of our packs go fishing and it's in the heat of the day. Well, the fish are not going to be at the surface at the heat of the day. So when's the best time to go fishing? Early in the morning or later in the evening? We don't know that. So that's why the CAI program was designed is to give that average scouter enough information to feel confident in bringing this critical outdoor program to our uh, units. The other thing I wanna bring up is a lot of times the state agencies look at the scouting program as a birthday party. Oh, you guys are just coming in and you're going to do a one day uh, fishing derby and I'll never see you again. One of the things that I do is I educate the state agencies on the fact that we have a youth at the age of first grade through fifth grade. And we're talking about exactly the concepts that Howard talked about, the outdoor code. We talk about doing our duty to God and country. We're doing our duty to nature and becoming conservation minded. Ideally, how many people knew that it's important for you to have a fishing license with you, even though your youth is granted an exemption? from a fishing license. If he's under the age of 16 or she's under the age of 16, most states are gonna say, you're cool, you don't need a fishing license. However, if you touch that rod and reel, helping that youth 
get that fish in or casting that lure out or getting that fish or turtle off the hook, you are technically in violation if you do not have a fishing license. And what a better opportunity for you to teach good citizenship in buying an $8 or $12 fishing license supporting, as we talked about, our state agencies and the matching program through the federal government. The other thing that I say is once we graduate them through the Cub Scouting program, we then have age and skill-based merit badge programs, fishing merit badge, fly fishing merit badge, fish and wildlife management merit badge, where we're progressing this whole concept of conservation, not even talking about all the other merit badges and uh, ecology that we have, but those specifically. And then we develop what's called the Complete Angler Award. The Complete Angler Award provides an opportunity for that youth to demonstrate and educate others along the trail, such as those Cub Scouts, how to put a worm on a hook, how to tie an improved clinch knot, how to recite the outdoor code, the seven principles of leave no trace. With that, they become a complete angler. Then at the age of 15 and a half, they're invited to come and become a certified angling instructor with the Boy Scouts, where there they'll be qualified and trained as program counselors for your summer camps at your council level camps. That is truly everything but a one shot wonder at a, at a camp. And then we all know how critical Eagle Scouts are and their uh, conservation issues and their voting rights when they become an outside adult. So what I'm suggesting is if you guys are interested in learning more about this, you don't have to be an expert fisherman, okay? The co concept is you're becoming an angler educator. This is a train the trainer kind of course. I'm going to give you proven techniques and best practices, how to engage Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, and leaders in how to have fun and educate and provide quality outdoor program that families value. Then what will happen is they'll be the basis for our other programs, most specifically as the Distinguished Conservation Service Award, which I am also an advisor on. And uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna offer this course at the National Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Conference. It's going to be uh, set up uh, as a hybrid class. We're <laughs> gonna have some uh, online segments like we're doing here in St. Louis right now. And we'll meet a couple of nights for an hour and a half at a time. And then when we get to the conference, we'll have complete field days where we'll actually have hands-on fly tying, fly fishing instruction, catching a fish, and just doggone practicing everything we learned on the TV screen. So be looking for the invite. We'd love to have you. Uh, I'd like to just, by a show of hands, tell me how many people here are certified angling instructors. <laughs> I am. Give me a reaction. <laughs> There's a lot. I know there are a lot here. Yeah. All right. Excellent. So I see Kathy, Jeffrey, uh, Richard Cole, I think is one. I saw, all, keep putting those fingers up, guys. I want to see that. So. It's excellent, okay? What you can do for us is continue to get us butts in our training chairs because the number one task that we all have is the membership. And membership, the biggest way to membership is through fishing programs. Everybody likes to fish. Everybody has a picture of a smiling fish. Howard, I know you don't like a fish hanging, but <laughs> doggone it, that smile on a kid's fish brings me more scouts. So yeah, I'll go, exactly. I'll so. try, but you know, I understand, <laughs> but it makes, it sells. And that's what we're here for. Well, thank you very much, Michael. I, I appreciate it. You can tell the enthusiasm that Michael has as far as uh, teaching everybody about being a certified angling instructor. Um, you know, to me, it is definitely something important because, as he mentioned, you know, we, we do have a kind of a lost generation of outdoor uh, youth and 
this is one way to really engage them that I think, you know, uh, would really kind of add a lot of a lot of mileage to what we're trying to accomplish as far as being outdoor ethics educators. All right. Um, thank you very much. Again. Howard, again. Howard, I do want this is the first time I met you or beside the phone call. I had no idea how important you were to the beginning. And I've been using all your your stuff and I had no idea. So I am I, I'm within greatness. It's like, uh, no, well, I wouldn't say that. Thank you. Well, but it they, is. It is. I, I appreciate the bridges you built for us. I am. I am a great hair by, you know, by many regards. So thank you very much, Michael. All right. Well, let's let's go ahead and move forward. All right. My guys, you got to exit the class and I'll see you on the other side. Let me go ahead and go through just some resources for training. And, you know, I want to just really highlight and then I'm going to turn it over because I know Scott needs to talk as well. Um, first and foremost, go to these. You're going to be able to download this presentation. But the International Game Fist Association, uh, the Aquatic Resources Education Association, Take Me Fishing is huge. Trout Unlimited, which I mentioned, um, I was a... Uh, a trustee you know, for Trout Unlimited, the Federation of Fly Fishers, all fantastic organizations, all fantastic resources. Reach out to them. They have people that will help you if you want to implement any kind of program. And fly fishers in particular are very, very ethical, believe it or not. So that's definitely a, a route I would take. Um, then quite obviously, the fishing and the fly fishing merit badge pamphlets, truly in a nutshell, without you getting too much in the weeds, those are the place to go to as far as resources are concerned. And then finally, the fishing leave no trace pamphlet and the fishing hang, uh, leave no trace hang tag um, all kind of touch on those things. Very, very important. Paul, next slide. And then last but not least is just my ugly, my ugly face right there. This is actually a fish that I caught just two weeks ago, as a matter of fact. But, you, you know, to Michael's point, when you're smiling, when you're catching a fish, you're definitely smiling. Um, this fish was out of the water all of 30 seconds before I released him uh, back into the water and he swam away very strongly. So you can catch a fish, you can catch a big fish, and you can put it back in the resource and somebody else is going to catch that big brown trout at some point, I know for a fact. So that is why you want to learn this stuff. That is why you want to talk to people about it and really kind of in, uh, encourage that participation in a and an outdoor activity that I think is really, really easy for families and individuals to do. And with that, Paul, I'll turn it back over to you, okay? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Howard. That was awesome. Uh, always, uh, every, every time, you know, we've already talked and here I learned so much more. This is, this is great. So with that, I'm gonna lead us into our next topic, which Scott Anderson is gonna talk to us about advancement changes. and. Okay, Scott, you get to follow that. So here you go. And Paul, I'm going to rely on you to advance the slides. You can go ahead and take yep. the next one. It says the same thing. <laughs> uh, greetings, everybody. Great to see so many familiar faces. Uh, and thank you, Howard and uh, Michael, for an exciting presentation on one of Scouting's best programs. Uh, my topic tonight is just to try to cover uh, some of the advancement changes that were announced back in June. Uh, the National Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Committee worked hard over the last few years to try to make some recommendations uh, to improve some of the advancement uh, ranking advancement requirements. Uh, so we'd specifically like to thank Program Development and the Scouts BSA Committee for the improvements that they adopted and uh, we look forward to uh, partnering with them for future changes as the years go on. Uh, so the Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Committee was charged with examining the continuum of the Outdoor Ethics Advancement Program of Cub Scouts, Scouts BSA and Venstrom. Outdoor Ethics is an important through all of our programs and in all of our outings. So not all of our recommendations were incorporated and some of the positive changes came directly from the Scouts BSA committee once they understood our goals. So in this presentation, I'm just gonna reference the changes that are improvements to scouting's outdoor ethics. Uh, there were some other advancement changes that are unrelated to us and I will not be covering them in this presentation. So outdoor ethics and conservation in scouting, where does it all begin? Well, it starts with lion cubs and their basic or their exposure to nature and animals 
And it builds through Cub Scouts and the Scouts BSA and the venturing programs to teach impact awareness, responsible practices and skills, conservation and stewardship. Key guidance is provided by our outdoor code and the seven principles of Leave No Trace. The changes were recommended to address some of the following things, consistency and continuity across the scouting programs, and particularly that we lose the scout transition. Uh, it was designed to support the development of the learning progression. So hearing, repeating, explaining, doing, understanding, anticipating, teaching, promoting. And you can go ahead and advance the next slide. Uh, learning the ethical principles and practices while also learning the skills that you need to uh, do those things. Understanding the why. Why do we do things the way we do? And then program appropriateness and the progression of skills. Be prepared. Scouts should be taught and taught the practice and the skills before they need to use them. And then lastly, to develop an understanding, a respect, responsibility, and stewardship for our outdoor, uh, outdoors and our environment. Uh, for references, the Scout BSA, the Scout Handbook, and the Field Book are the primary references for our outdoor skills and practices. They provide excellent guidance on our outdoor ethic practices, consistent with the current teachings of the Leave No Trace organization. Uh, so you can step on. So where does it begin? Well, it begins with the Scout Rank. And Cub Scouts come to Scouts BSA with some exposure to the outdoor code and the Lead No Trace Seven Principles for kids. Those who have earned the Arrow of Light will have memorized the outdoor code. So this new requirement is just a review for them. But this is where they get their first exposure to the standard Lead No Trace Seven Principles. And we felt that it needed to be included in the very first Scout rank. So the first thing Scouts do is learn those new standard seven principles of Leave No Trace. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Uh, one of the other requirements here was about uh, pocket using a pocket knife. And we simply added the word safely and responsibly. And responsible to us includes not carving trees and damaging property. So a simple little word change, uh, made, we felt made a significant improvement in that requirement. Next slide. Now we move on to Tenderfoot. Uh, and here again, we, we've decided to put Lead No Trace into uh, the new requirement. So instead of just practicing the outdoor code on a camp out or an island, we want to explain how they demonstrated the outdoor code and Lead No Trace on campouts and outings. Now, this puts outdoor code and leave no trace on almost an equal footing. And it adds the premise that you always put them into practice for all outings. Next slide. Uh, here, the old requirement, this is like a, a pocket life safety. We add the word responsible and this gives us an opportunity or opens the door to teach traveling on durable surfaces. When we talk about hiking responsible, well, we're going to do that in an environmentally sound way, a way that creates the least impact on the environment. So uh, again, just a simple wordsmithing to that requirement, we felt made a significant difference. Next slide. Now we move on to second class, and here we get a little bit more skill-based uh, they're going to now recite from memory the Leave No Trace Seven Principles and explain how they follow them on all outings. So again, we're reinforcing that idea that we always follow the outdoor code and always use the seven principles of Leave No Trace for guidance on how we behave in the outdoors. Uh, next slide. Now here uh, is the old requirement for second class requirement 2C. And we've added some changes to this and you can step onto the next slide. We started off by saying using a minimum impact method. Uh, so our idea here is that we wanted to 
uh, hope to reinforce the need to only use an existing firing or other minimum impact method to build a fire, such as a pan fire or a mound fire. It also expands the responsibility of cleaning up after, the, after you have finished with your fire. So properly dispose of the ashes and any charred remains. Now, there are gonna be huge differences on these practices depending on where you're at. And it becomes the responsibility of leadership to know what those rules and regulations are and to make sure that our scouts uh, follow and properly dispose of ashes as part of their fire management plan. Next slide. Uh, so here's another one where uh, uh, the old first class requirement is to explain the principles of tread lightly. And this is where we made the most significant change in the advancement program. Uh, while tread lightly provides an alternative set of outdoor ethic principles, the leading no trace principles, we think provide a clearer, more complete and more relevant guidance for, for scout to first class outdoor skills and ethics. Removing the requirement to learn tread lightly principles reduces some of the confusion as to what outdoor ethic guidance do I follow when I'm doing this trip or that trip. And we just wanted it to be more consistent. So we thought it would be better if we focused on the leave no trace principles. I'd like to start out or conclude by saying tread lightly is very important to our scouting program for specific guidance on activities not covered by leave no trace. Tread lightly promotes outdoor ethics specific to motorized recreation and such as our all-terrain vehicles and powered watercraft. And that these are more advanced outdoor programs that are not universally provided to all scouts. The Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Committee fully supports and recommends the practice of tread lightly principles whenever scouts are participating in motorized recreational activities or backcountry shooting sports. And additionally, Tread Lightly provides excellent outdoor ethics teaching resources uh, that apply to all different disciplines in outdoor recreation. And those resources, along with the ed educational programs that they offer, they remain a valued partner for the Boy Scouts of America. So next, if you'll, next slide. So instead of learning the principles of Leave No Trace, uh, we're having them focus on the impacts. And we felt that if, if they concentrate on learning more about their impacts, they would have a much more or deeper understanding of why Leave No Trace and the Outdoor Code are so important. And one more requirement was changed and that was requirement 2D, you can step on. Uh, demonstrate the procedure of, uh, in safe handling of, of uh, materials and disposing of your waste. If you'll step on the next slide, you'll see that we simply added wastewater to some of the things that needed to be properly disposed of at camp. And uh, that's another area where there's going to be differences from property to property and leadership needs to know uh, what the expectations are, the land managers where they're recreating, and it makes disposing of the wastewater a part of the waste management plan that a first class, a first class scout should understand. And that's it for the requirement changes. Uh, I will hang out for questions when we get to the question section of uh, tonight's round table. Uh, and you can also contact me at any time uh, through program operations at uh, outdoorethics-bsa.org, uh, or you can contact me directly. My email you can find on the outdoorethics-bsa.org website. So thank you so much. And I hope to see you at our National Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Conference in November. Thank you very much, Scott. That was a lot to go through there. I think those are good changes, though. I, I like them. So all of you, if you've been here last year, you'll know that one of the things we really, really appreciate from you, is something you can do to help us, is give us your feedback. And if you would just take a minute and go to the, the link here. If you've got your phone, you can just scan the, the, uh, the code right there. And 
it's a quick questions and it will help us tremendously in getting these roundtables to bring you the content that, that will help you the most. That's what we want to do. So please take take a moment and uh, and give us your feedback. Now we have a uh, Matt put together a nice video here uh, about the conference. So let's watch this video. Hello, Scouters. Every two years, we have the chance to get together with other members of the Scouting Outdoor Ethics community. We've met at camps in locations as diverse as New Jersey, Utah, and Kansas. We even met virtually when the pandemic made it impossible to meet in person. An incredible effort has been made to return to in-person conferences this year, and we are pleased to say that we will be meeting in person November 10th through 13th, 2022 at Burt Adams Scout Camp outside of Atlanta, Georgia. This year's conference will be even more special as we bring outdoor ethics and conservation together under the same roof. This gathering will feature presentations and activities led by your fellow scouters from all over the nation. We will also receive information and updates from Leave No Trace, Tread Lightly, and the National Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Subcommittee. As always, there will be a number of pre-conference trainings during the days preceding the conference. This year, it will include a Master Tread Trainer course BSA Certified Angler Instructor Training, a Distinguished Conservation Service Award Advisor Training, and a special session for Council Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Advocates. These trainings will take place on the 9th and 10th of November, leading up to the official start of the conference on the evening of the 10th. Food and lodging will be provided and included in the cost of the conference, unless you plan to stay off-site. Burt Adams Scout Camp is an amazing and beautiful facility with great cell service and Wi-Fi. Fall in Georgia is a lovely time and you can expect cool and somewhat damp conditions. So how much does it cost and where can I register? Well, the conference costs $290, but if you sign up before September 1st, you'll get an early bird discount and only pay $260, which is pretty awesome. Um, be aware that each of the individual pre-conference sessions have their own costs involved, so you want to check those out as you're registering. The registration website is listed on this slide, but you can find that and get to it from outdoorethics-bsa.org. It's right on the front page uh, under the conference section. Uh, you can also find information about this on our Facebook group. Come join us and all of your other scouting friends November 10th through 13th at the National Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Conference at Bird Adams Scout Camp in Georgia. We hope to be able to see you there so that we can treasure the past, honor the present, and shape the future together. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, and uh, I just saw a note come out too that uh, guest speaker is going to be Douglas Doug Tallamy. Is that correct? I believe so. Yep, that's pretty awesome. That would be great. Now, I also put in in the chat in case you haven't seen it. Um, the pre con some of the pre conference workshops do have an additional cost to them. I put the cost for each of those down in the uh, in the chat there. Um, those are optional. Those happen before the course on either the 9th and 10th or just on the 10th. Um, and they're not a part of the cost of the, the conference, which will be the 10th through the 13th. So uh, if you want to take those, you can and add it onto the conference or you can just come to the conference by itself. Thank you very much. So uh, as always, we want to put in a plug for the, the Dan Howells uh, Fund. Um, if, if you are unable to attend a, a master educator course, would like to, but funding's a problem, apply for a scholarship. If you um, would like to help sponsor others to become master educators, please donate to the fund. So we've got the money in the fund for, for others to go here. Um, I don't know, put Paula on the spot. Do you know where we stand on, on scholarships at this point? Paul, I'm I'm on that committee as well. We gave away okay. two. We gave yes, away two we so. gave away two this year. So. Okay. Awesome. 
And it was very exciting because it was for one for, I believe, one for Northern Tier and one for um, Philmont. And those are the high cost ones. So it was nice that they could get get a scholarship. Wonderful. And with that, I'd like to move and, and close the, the round table with my, my reflection here. Um, this time I've got, I've got a reflection from a different person. We're talking about fishing. So of course I turned to Isaac Walton. Um, I don't know how many of you know much about Isaac Walton, but he was an avid angler. He was born in England in 1593. His book, The Complete Angler, was first published in 1653. It's still in print. You can buy it on Amazon today if you want to. It's uh, one of the most reprinted books in the English language. Uh, Walton didn't pro profess to be the expert fisherman, the angler. He, uh, there's some technical discussion of fishing in the book, but it's written as a dialogue between Piscator, the fisherman, and Venator, the hunter. But that's not what makes it special. What makes it unique is the emphasis he puts on fishing as an environmental, social, and spiritual experience. It goes back to what Howard was talking about with the quote from Thoreau, that, uh, that there's so much more to fishing than just throwing something in the water and pulling a fish out. That's not really what it's about. So here, here's a quote from him. And um, I saw Howard also use this on the cover of his paper, uh, the this, this same quote here. Rivers and the inhabitants of the watery element were made for wise men to contemplate and fools to pass by without consideration. I, what I'd like to challenge each of us to do is as we're out and about and we do go past the water, so often it's easy. You just walk past and you know you just see there's water but we don't think about that's a whole nother world. It, and it's part of our world, just like the world of air that we, we are in. Take some time, consider what's going on there. What would be living in that water? Why would they be living there? What are their, you know, what are the things that they want? So we just add them to the environment. Great questions you can ask the kids uh, to, to get them to think about the water. And it's not just something that they throw a rock in. It's actually a, a whole nother environment and part of our world as well. So with that, I believe we're coming to the end. Once again, please, please, we value your feedback. And uh, next month we will be talking about summer camp. So we hope to see you all then.